you are aware, <clears throat> you are probably aware of the power of PPC marketing and online advertising. Now, probably familiar with statistics like digital ads can increase brand awareness by 80% or that consumers are 155% more likely to look up your brand specific terms after they've been exposed to display ads or that PPC can return $2 for every $1 spent at 200% ROI. However, if you're running digital advertising at the moment, it can be a competitive space with a few challenges that you need to contend with such as the fact that 65% of small to mid-sized businesses already have a PPC campaign running. 45% of them have a paid search strategy in place. But digital ad fraud cost US advertisers $15.9 billion just this past year. And less than 20% of marketers use landing page A-B tests to improve conversion rates. And perhaps most importantly of all, about 70% to 80% of people completely ignore paid digital Ads. So how do we solve it for these challenges? Our guest has a platform and experience to help. We'll explore that in a moment. Hello and welcome to the Predictable B2B Success Podcast brought to you by Sprintwith.com. I'm Renee Koshi and our guest today is Frederick Valleys. Did I say that correctly? Your last name? Yeah, you did. Okay, excellent. Frederick uh, Valleys. And Fred, you are a seasoned Silicon Valley entrepreneur, author, and leading influencer in the PPC search and marketing space. In fact, you were one of Google's first 500 employees. You helped pioneer PPC marketing as the company's first AdWords evangelist. Today, of course, you are the CEO and the co-founder of Optimizer, a leading and award-winning PPC management platform. You also authored two books about automation and how we use it to gain a competitive advantage in digital marketing. The books being Digital Marketing in an AI World, Future Proofing Your PC Agency, and Unlevel Playing Field, the biggest mind shift in PC history. Fred, you've obviously had quite a journey to date, but I'm curious, your foray and the journey in BBC space, did that begin with a particular incident while you were at Google or was it something else altogether? No, good. Google actually <laughs> came afterwards. So it started in my college dorm room at Stanford in 1998. I heard about this thing called goto.com where you could just go and buy a keyword and then your ads would show up along some sort of a search. It wasn't even Google, wasn't like a big search engine back mm -hmm. then, but you could run your ads on Yahoo. And I was like, okay, I can go to the local blockbuster and pick up some video cassettes that they're selling way before they're supposed to sell them at consumer prices. And I can buy a keyword through GoTo and can actually like arbitrage that video cassette. And that's what I did. That's how I got into wow. PC. But I didn't make a lot of money, right? It was just in college, just making a little bit of weekend money. <laughs> and then a couple of years later, I lost my job at the dot-com bubble bursting in 2000. So I'd worked at Sapient to do IT consulting. And then I started looking for a new company to join. And Google was like this up and coming thing. I was like, yeah, that could be cool to go and work there. I started working in the ads division and all of a sudden, like my eyes opened to the fact that people were spending $30,000 a month on Google ads. Mm -hmm. And these were big numbers back in the day, right? Mm -hmm. Nowadays, if you spend $30,000 a day, okay. <laughs> uh, and not everybody has to spend that money, but it was like, oh my God, if they're spending so much money, they must be making so much money in return. And that's when I started putting the pieces together and PPC really clicked for me. That was super exciting. And like you said in your intro with all those numbers of how much return on ad spend you can get and how much it can help you grow your business. Uh, it was just exciting to me. And so I started doing more of it myself. And as I was using the Google ads products while also working at Google, it really gave me this dual perspective that made me into a good person to be an evangelist, to go out there and say, this is how you can really use it. The engineers have built this and they think mm. you should use it this way, but this is the way you should really do it because this is how you're going to get more success. And that's how it all started. Brilliant. And uh, given your journey to date, what would you say would be your personal area of strength? My personal area of strength, I have an engineering degree. I think I also know how to talk to people, which isn't always a combination a lot of people have. So yeah. that, that's kind of what makes an evangelist. An evangelist yeah. is typically someone who's got a little bit of a technical bend, but can also go and explain it to a non-technical audience. And so I would say that's my strength. I like teaching and I'm a little bit lazy, so I like automating things. And when you explain to people how they can make their lives better and more efficient 
by using technology and automation and deploy it in the field that they're active in. I think people really like that. And so that's, that's, I think, why I'm decent at what I do. <laughs> in that area of strength, what would you say is something that businesses don't know, but should? I think when the, sort of the big theme is that everybody's afraid about automation or they're afraid mm -hmm. of automation. And some people are resistant to it because they feel like it's taking away their jobs. The key thing that I want people to know is that if you put your human intellect on top of the machines and you combine those two together, you're going to get better results. It's not about all in on automation or not using automation at all. It's what is that happy middle, that happy medium. And that's what generally leads to the best results. And there've been some great Boston consulting studies that they did. And they were like, if you put automation in play in PC, search engine marketing, you're going to get something like 20% better results. But if you layer human, or if you as a human remain involved and steer those mm -hmm. machines and those automation in the direction that you want, you get another 10% advantage. And so 10% may not sound like a whole lot, but when you think about the types of numbers of the money that's being spent on digital ads, even on a $10,000 budget, that's still a thousand dollars of value that you bring. And that doesn't mean you have to be spending 40 hours a week doing things with these machines, right? That could be just you checking in and having a really good automation of your own that you put on top of Google's that makes sure the machines actually work towards your goal as opposed to towards Google's goal, which is going to be fundamentally different, right? And so it's like how you manipulate automations. That's a big thing. That, that's a big value that you can bring. But this idea of managing these automations to your own advantage would you say that there is perhaps an over-reliance, at least in some circles, on these automations to manage campaigns, especially in light of how perhaps e-commerce and legion is conducted? Yeah. And so I think sometimes it's over-reliance, but I think oftentimes it's not really understanding what those automations are doing. So one really good example is Google has this new campaign type. It's called Performance Max. And there's very few settings that you put in. You primarily put in what's your landing page, a few assets, like headlines, maybe some videos. And then what is your goal? Is it to maximize conversion value? Maybe you have a return on ad spend target. And you put that in. And so this campaign now starts running and it gives you really good results because it's generally going to hit the return on ad spend target that you set. But like start peeling back the layers of that onion. And you start to understand, oh, Google's spending a lot of money on video or on the display network. And maybe they're cannibalizing my brand from my existing search campaigns. Maybe they're showing my ads in a remarketing way. Maybe it's actually my SEO efforts that are bringing people into my site. And then sure, we're cookieing them, putting them on the remarketing list. And now this new campaign type comes in and swoops in and gets all the credit. And so once you start peeling back those layers and understanding how is it actually achieving those great numbers? Then you might say, good, it did what I asked it to do, but maybe I didn't ask enough of it. Maybe I can push it a little bit harder and say, okay, stay away from my brand. Like my brand should be cheap. That mm -hmm. shouldn't be subsidizing really expensive clicks that come from somewhere else. And so I think that's the over-reliance is maybe the blind trust that some people have in automation right. and they don't ask the right questions anymore. And so they... They don't get the best performance or not as good as they could. I'm also curious, we've looked at some of the numbers in terms of bringing about an ROI of biodigital campaign, but the, there's also this fact that a vast majority of people tend to ignore these kinds of ads. I'm just wondering, how do we correlate the fact that it still can provide a good ROI, the fact that the vast majority of people seem to be skipping over some of these ads? Is it just that the the audience that do view or click on these ads and really have a different kind of intent or is it something else? Yeah. I don't know that I fully believe the numbers of how many people skip okay. the ads. And again, this is a fairly old anecdote I'm going to bring up here, but in my earlier days as the Google AdWords evangelist, as it was known back then, 
but I'd go in front of an audience and I would ask people, so how many of you have never clicked on an ad in this room? And like you said, 80, 90% of people would raise their hand. And then I would look at these numbers, look at how much revenue Google's making from people clicking on ads. The thing is, you probably just didn't realize it was an ad because it looked like a search result. It was answering your question. It wasn't interrupting what you were doing. And so maybe you didn't perceive it as an ad, but yes, it, it was an ad. Now, then there's the whole question about is Google labeling the ads clearly enough as a sponsored result, as a paid result? And they've probably gone down a path of where it's less clear what is an ad as far as labeling. But at the end of the day, I think the consumer cares about relevant answers. If I have a question, I want the answer that helps me achieve something. And oftentimes, an ad is the best answer. If you have a, a leaky toilet or a clogged toilet or a leaky faucet, does it matter to you that you clicked on an ad if that plumber who charges you a fair price shows up in an hour? Would you rather have that quick experience or would you rather go down a list of organic results and start doing a lot of research? So I think that's where a lot more consumers than we think actually do click on these ads. And they're happy because they get what they need. And But regardless of whether it's 80% or 20% of people who don't click on ads, the fact is they're still... I mean, we, how many people are in the world? 7 billion these days, right? If not more. Even if I can get a tiny fraction of those, that's going to help my business grow. Like that's going to drive a productive result for me. So we talked about how we handle the automations for e-commerce and lead gen, but should they be managed similarly from a PPC point of view? I think so. And so that's one maybe... Not a misconception, but I think a mistake that some advertisers make, and especially in B2B, right? In B2B, mm -hmm. you generally tend to think about lead generation. And when you bring it back to search marketing and PPC, you tend to think about a cost per acquisition target. That's how you measure things. But the fact is that someone filling out a lead form on your page or someone picking up the phone and calling your sales team not all those leads are equal. That's why we have CRMs. That's why your marketing team will mark certain leads as better than others, sales qualified, marketing qualified. Mm -hmm. Even if somebody is sales qualified, some of those customers will have a big order. Some of those customers will have a small order. So there's different sizes. And so bringing that all back to pure cost per acquisition, I think ignores a lot of what e-commerce gets right, which is every time you make a sale, you should look at the basket value of what somebody actually bought and that feeds into the return on ad spend calculation, right? If I spend $1 to get someone to buy a $100 basket versus I spend $1 to get someone to check out with a $200 basket, the $200 basket is far better. And it's easier to do in e-commerce because there's a literal cost at the moment of the checkout that's very easy to press back to Google. It's much harder in B2B, but we see a lot of advertisers actually going towards that same model. So they start to value the leads at different levels and actually passing the value with those. And now they can go into return on ad spend bidding. And here's the thing, right, Vinay? It doesn't have to be precise. You don't have to know exactly how much a lead is worth. But if you can do something as simple as say, I think this lead looked a little bit better than that one. Hence, I put a little bit more value on this first one. Now. The bid management system from Google, which by and large is automated these days, will say, okay, if I had the choice to pay a dollar for the first lead or the second lead, it looks like the first one's better because Vinay told me that it has a slightly higher value. And that value is not precise, but it helps the bidding automation pick the right click for you to buy. And so I think in that way, e-commerce and leads actually should be more similar in how they are treated. We see that's not always the case, but the most successful advertisers are definitely heading down that path. Now, you talked about performance max and the similar sorts of automations that appear on these platforms like Google as a native kind of feature. So talk to us about your platform. If there's so much automation available natively on these platforms, what sort of additional automation do we need to make our jobs easier to get the best results? Yeah. So we think about that from the perspective at Optimizer in terms of automation layering, PPC insurance. And so again, here you have these automations from Google, from Microsoft, from Amazon, and they are basically big machine learning models, big AI models that are tuned to everything, every advertiser who's been in that system. 
The fact is your business is probably unique in some way. Very simple, classic example. But if you sell umbrellas, you probably sell more umbrellas during rainy season or when there's a rainstorm, right? So Google's automated bidding can look at factors like, oh, well, what type of demographic buys more umbrellas or what kind of region tends to buy more umbrellas? But the fact that there's a rainstorm predicted tomorrow in the middle of summer in California when it doesn't rain that often, that might be something that gets more people to buy umbrellas at a time when it's not usually expected. So if you can go back into the bidding system and say, typically we have a return on ad spend target that's 5x, but tomorrow we're willing to take a slightly lower return on ad spend because we know that our conversion rate is going to be unexpectedly higher Mm -hmm. due to this external factor in the world or due to some business factor, right? You can feed that back into Google and you can manipulate these systems a little bit. You can steer them in the direction that you want to go. Now, all of that could take a lot of human time. You could sit there at your computer every day, looking at the weather forecast, looking at your business metrics and making all these tweaks in the system. Where Optimizer really comes in is we help you create rules and automations around this. So you can connect a weather feed to the system, or you can say, We've been using automated bidding from Google and it's done pretty well, but push it harder. How can you push it harder? Well, we have a tool that will split the campaign by different geographies and will group the geographies with similar performance attributes. And so now each of these campaigns gets new targets and Google is going to have to work a little bit harder to get you those conversions in those regions, but it's actually going to optimize the whole thing. Um, We can also do cross-platform optimization. So if you're running Facebook ads, Amazon, Google, Microsoft ads, we can shift your budgets between the channels that are working best. Prioritize your money where you get the highest return on ad spend. And then if you still have budget left, go to the next best platform. And as that changes, again, because something external in the world happens that maybe there's some bad news about Facebook and all of a sudden people aren't advertising there anymore. We can shift those budgets back into the place where it actually makes sense. So those are some of the things that there's much more that we can do. But again, it's back to that notion that, you know, don't just trust the automation from the big ad engine, do your own thing in conjunction with that. And you're going to get better results. You mentioned PPC insurance. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. So <laughs> PPC insurance. So I had a personal experience with a PMAX campaign. No, actually it was not PMAX. It was automatically applied recommendations from Google. So Google has these suggestions on their dashboard. And so one of the suggestions would be that they can clean up duplicate or redundant keywords. And basically what they're saying is you shouldn't have to maintain a very complicated Google ad structure to get good results. So if they find a keyword that they consider to be redundant, they can automatically remove that. So I was doing some experimentation. And by accident, I turned this option on for Google. Now, the next day, my team notifies me and they're like, hey, Fred, did do you know that the keyword optimizer or brand name, that keyword is removed? Like, what happened? And so we look into it and Google's automated system had removed that keyword because it felt it was redundant mm. to a bunch of other keywords, which were misspellings of our brand name. And I was like, okay, maybe that's reasonable. Maybe the misspellings were actually performing better. So we dug deeper into the data and that was not the case. We found that actually what Google had done was our highest converting keyword with the best cost per acquisition. That is the keyword they decided was redundant. So they disabled it. They removed it. So what's PPC insurance? PPC insurance for us is we have tools that will look for these scenarios. They will say, oh, here's a keyword that was automatically removed by Google that was driving a lot of conversions. You should know about this, right? So at the Mm. very least, you should get the notification, but we can take that automation to the next level. We can also say, if we see this happening, reactivate that keyword or add that Mm. keyword back in. So that's one thing. The other thing we see a lot of Google playing with budgets. So they deliver twice as much of your budget in a given day as what you are allowing. And they do this because over the span of a 30 day period, it's going to balance out. But a lot of advertisers don't like this because overspending on one day Maybe that performance is not going to be as good as if they had saved that budget for the other days of the week. Um, And again, this is based on your own business knowledge. For some advertisers, this is a good thing. For some, it's a bad thing. But if you know it's a bad thing for Google to overspend, we have PPC insurance tools 
that will look for this behavior. Every hour we check right. your account. And if Google goes above, say, 20% more than your daily budget or 30%, you pick mm. the number or literally goes one penny over your budget, it pauses those campaigns, it pauses those budgets, and then the next day it turns them back on. So it puts you in charge of how your ads are run, and it prevents these like weird runaway cost things happening, these weird keywords being paused, all of these things that may be mm. undesirable. So then, okay. So uh, given, given the levels of automation that, uh, that can take place, what is your take on whether you should be pursuing target cost acquisition in terms of bidding or target return on ad spend bidding? Yeah. So it's a good question, right? And so Google has this thing, they call it value-based bidding. And that's basically making the case that target return on ad spend is a more powerful system than target cost per acquisition. Now, there's a caveat to that, right? So if you sell a single type of service or a single product, and that product has the same margin no matter what, and people tend to buy exactly one of that product, they don't sell their basket with 10 or 20 or different quantities. So if the value of your typical conversion is very locked in, then target cost per acquisition is fine because you don't need variability based on what type of conversion right. happened. But the moment that you have any sort of variability between your conversions, whether that's I sell solar roofing and I know that this zip code, people have bigger houses. So when I install solar panels, they tend to be more of them because they have a bigger roof to put them on, right? That's, I'm still selling solar panels. Each one panel costs the same amount, but I sell more panels in the zip code you should go to target return on ad spend. You should be quantifying what is the difference in value from these different leads. Mm -hmm. And then you can set a target return on ad spend bidding mechanism. And now you're doing value-based bidding. Now you're actually helping automations from Google get you more of the highest value conversions. And, and the scary thing here is if you undervalue, if you say, I'm going to go with a target cost per acquisition, and I'm going to set a really low number, artificially low. Like I know that typically it costs me $20 per conversion, but I'm going to go to Google and I'm going to say, get me a $5 cost per acquisition. Google can get you leads. They can probably get you leads at $5, but how good are those leads? A lead is someone filling out a form on your page. It's not someone actually buying something from you. So guess what kind of quality traffic Google's going to be able to buy for you at these cheap costs. It's the traffic nobody else wants to buy. That's what makes it cheap. And why does nobody else want to buy it? Well, it's because more sophisticated advertisers have figured out that sure, they'll fill out the form, but they'll never pay for the product. And so that's the, the trap that you can fall into by saying, oh, I'm just going to bid lower. It's going to give me more results. And yeah, on paper, you got more conversions, but your business revenue or your business profit actually declined. So there's a lot to think about to the metrics and how you set up your campaigns. Perhaps more traditionally, a lot of people have said we need to focus in on the messaging creativity of the ads and optimizing for that. Is that still very much an issue today? How much time and effort do you find advertisers spending on these sorts of things as opposed to perhaps the other levels of automation? Yeah, no, it's super interesting. I think it's partly this way because bid management, budget management, Anything to do with numbers has been really easy to automate. It's some mm. basic math, and then you make changes based on that. When it comes to creative and landing pages, that's the thing that for a very long time we said, that's the human domain. Only humans can be creative. But now, of course, we were looking at generative AI, mm -hmm. which has been around for a little while, but it was really Chat GPT that popularized it a couple of months ago. And it's changed my mind as well. So now generative AI can actually do a quite good job at writing headlines for your ads, coming up with creative. It can generate images that you can use for your ads. Now, I think there's still an element of human involvement that's required. So usually what we see works really well is the human comes up with maybe the first five, seven variations of a headline for an ad. But then you get writer's block, right? And you're like, okay, go to GPT, give me seven more variations like this, but maybe a little bit more salesy or maybe a little bit more value proposition focused. And boom, it gives you seven options. You put them in and great, your work is done. And now Google's machine can go to work figuring out what combinations of these headlines 
are going to be most effective. So that's what they call responsive search ads. So yeah, I think the amount of time we need to spend on creative is going to decline. And a lot of automation is coming to that. In fact, Optimizer has been using GPT before chat GPT to suggest headlines to advertisers. And that's one thing that we very clearly see, like all of this GPT, generative AI technology, super exciting. But the big question is, if I'm, if I'm an agency and I run 20 ad campaigns and each one of them has 100 campaigns within the account, am I really going to go to GPT for each one of these now 2,000 campaigns to ask for more ad variations? You know, I just don't have time for that. But if you put it into the workflow of a tool like Optimizer and we can point out, we can say, listen, here's an ad that's no longer performing quite as well. And here's a couple of headlines that we've already gotten for you from a generative AI. Simply click to accept those very quick, right? And so now you're constantly this process that you already had of optimization now is enhanced with a new type of AI that can be very helpful. Again, humans plus machines better than machines alone. That I think that still holds very much. Just on that thought, I, I can't help but think all this sounds fantastic, but it's almost like removing ourselves from the customer in that we seem to be almost dependent on numbers and the user behavior on platforms to determine our next actions. Is there something to be said about spending time with the customer and understanding their thinking process and, and the way they approach things that should really occur before we actually set up and fine tune our campaigns? Yeah, absolutely. That's like the best advice. The best business advice I've ever gotten was a friend who said, listen, as you progress in your career, never become more than one level removed from the customer, right? Because knowing what drives the customer, that's fundamentally what still matters. And so it's a good point, right? Because we build a product at Optimizer. If I'm just building it in a void, then sure, I have a product and I can look at the numbers and my conversion rates and how much I'm bidding for those clicks. And I can optimize all of that. But at the end of the day, if my product starts to get away from what customers want, I'm going to hit a point at which I can no longer optimize my clicks and my bids to the point where I'm turning a profit. And so that's exactly right. And so not only are you going to get something that's easier to sell because it's actually what people want. Yeah, no, actually that's the whole point. So you, you have something that you can sell. And then as this is thing you can sell. Now you get creative and what is it? What were the sales objections that we heard when we talked to prospective customers? Oh, they thought it was too expensive or it was too slow or it was this or it was that. And sometimes you have to go back and fix the product. And sometimes you're like, actually, look, here's a value proposition. It is 20% faster than anything you can get from the competition. So maybe you don't love the speed of it, but it's still the best thing you can get out there. I would love a car that accelerated to 60 miles an hour in one second, but you just can't get that, right? So the fact that it does it in 2.4, that's pretty damn good because most cars hit around seven. Yeah. So you can craft your value proposition to what you know from your customers' demands. So thinking about customer demands and speaking perhaps to at least a few people who have been involved in the PPC space, I guess traditionally, a lot of the advertising is being focused towards the bottom of the funnel, so to speak. Uh, is it worth using things like Google AdWords, YouTube and discovery ads, et cetera, for more upper funnel campaigns. Yeah, absolutely. And so this has been the beauty of PPC is that it's been so highly measurable because it tends to be bottom of the funnel, but how do people start searching for the thing that you sell? They have to be aware. And so it depends a little bit on your business category, right? If you have something that's fairly well established, fairly well known, then there's nothing wrong with just running search ads because people are going to go look for it anyway, and then convert. Now, if you're in a newer category or you're launching a new product line, then you need to tell people about that thing. That, and YouTube, discovery ads would be great places to go and do these things. Even TV ads, newspaper ads, radio ads, like all the traditional media. This is where you build your, your brand and build awareness. Now, the question then becomes about measurement too, right? For a long time, Google's primary attribution model was last click attribution. So basically saying we are measuring return on ad spend by, by looking purely at like the conversions, the click that happened right before somebody purchased, but they were ignoring all of the upper funnel activity. 
And that's dangerous, right? Because mm. you're not valuing anything that happens early on. So then now you have automated bidding systems and they make decisions and they say, oh, all of this stuff in YouTube on discovery ads, it doesn't lead to sales. Therefore, I'm going to stop showing ads in these places. And so you narrow your funnel. But what comes out at the bottom is also going to be left. And that's why it's so important nowadays to use data-driven attribution or a different attribution model besides last click, because you want to look at the full picture and you even want to look beyond just one channel, right? So within Google ads, sure, discovery ads may have helped drive to the eventual conversion that came from a search ad. But what about the efforts that you did generating blog content? Or what about the Facebook ads that you ran? All of these other things, like you need a holistic picture that shows you where the value is being derived from. I think there's absolutely a place to do these things, but you got to measure it correctly. And then you have to feed it back to the machine so they can make good decisions around achieving your goals by using the full spectrum of what's available. Would keywords still have the same value as it has in the past? going forward, or is there perhaps a different way of, a different lever, if I could put it that way, to focus on in terms of maximizing it be where we set up our ads? Yeah, absolutely. Keyword's super important. I don't think that's really ever going to change. That's ultimately right. the expression of intent that someone gives. I think the evolution of the keyword itself is going to be interesting. You can already see this in GPT, right? So mm -hmm. If I'm having an interaction with a chat model, I'm going to phrase my needs very differently than if I go to a search engine like Google. And this is because we've all been trained that certain ways of typing in the query make Google give us the type of results that we want. And that's very different from how we would interact with a human or a voice assistant. But what's fascinating is that you can go to Microsoft's implementation of ChatGPT, so they have their own system that's based on yeah. that. And as you ask it a question, it then actually says, the first thing it says is now searching for, and then it tells you what is the keyword that your, your prompt has been turned into. Um, and so it's like prompt engineering and figuring out how does that change how people, the, the types of keywords that people are now searching for. There's that. And then the other thing, keywords are still super important, but they're not the only thing anymore. And that's because we now have access to audiences and audiences are super important. If you mm -hmm. can know that someone's an existing customer or that someone has been on Amazon looking for a travel guide to Bali, having that and then being able to do something on a display network or through search keywords and combining these two together, super powerful, right? It's more powerful than the keyword alone, but I don't think yeah. the keyword is going anywhere. In terms of things like visual SIPs, which seem to be increasing, on the search engine networks, do you see that increasingly coming to play in, into the ad space as well? Yeah, absolutely. And this is where Microsoft is probably a little bit more the leader. So they have, I think, 70% of their results now have mm. some visual component to it. And a picture is worth a thousand words is what people say. And so obviously images are going to be super useful. It does change how we advertise. It means we have to think about that element, the visual mm -hmm. aspect, it tends to be harder, right? It, it tends to consume more time. And so as PPC marketers, we may not love this because we love the fact that we can just choose a keyword, set a bid, write a little ad, couple headlines, and we're done with it. That's easy. Mm -hmm. Now when we're being asked, hey, do you have a video or do you have a fantastic image that's going to support that ad group? That's more difficult, right? But yeah. as our time is being freed up, from doing some of these things through tools like Optimizer, through the automations from the engines, that may just be where we have to shift more focus to. And by the way, like all of these generative AIs are also helping with that. So if you have an image, but it's not great, it'll make it look better. It'll change the background. It'll change the color hue all much faster than you would have been able to do this in the past with more legacy tools. As you speak, I can't help but wonder if uh, with all these automations being added on or the option of in the modern continue to occur, will we perhaps lose control over things like targeting, bidding, and messaging? We would rely perhaps on these AI tools and other automations to do that for us because it's just there on the platform. And if that is the case, is there perhaps the need, as you were talking about previously with your need for PPC insurance, 
for people with more forensic or investigative type skills to really ensure that campaigns are running the way it should. Yeah, no, and I think that's exactly right. So it's what is that human role that you play in this more automated world where there's maybe less transparency and it takes more of a forensic expert to, to peel the layers off mm -hmm. that onion, to dig deeper, to actually see what's going on. And again, that's worsted because we see that when you do this, you actually mm -hmm. get meaningfully better results that are worth money to your business. So it's worth investing in these things. Yeah, loss of control is like, it's a huge topic in the industry. And every time Google announces something that the exact match keyword is becoming a little bit less exact, or there's a new campaign type where they don't allow you to add negative keywords like performance max. These, these are, they cause a bit of an uproar in the industry. I think what we ultimately need to balance is what is it we're trying to achieve? And this was something that dawned on me recently, but you have audience targeted campaigns and then people go in and they're like, I want to exclude certain placements on the display network. But then the question goes to why, if, you, if the whole point is you're targeting an audience, who cares what website they're on? And so is that the right level of control to ask for? And granted, sometimes it is. Sometimes there's really bad websites out there. You want to take control over those, right? There's, uh, you mentioned it, click fraud. There's websites that are purely built for click fraud. So that you need to get rid of. But also kind of like taking a step back and saying, we don't need control for the sake of control. We just need control to keep our brand protected and to make sure we get great results. But at the end of the day, if the great results come out, then, you know, maybe it doesn't matter that much. You just need more of these insurance systems that make sure nothing crazy happens, right? That your video doesn't show on a channel on YouTube that is full of hate speech, mm. right? Because that's a very negative brand association. Google's done tremendous work to make that not so much of an issue anymore. But as they fix one thing, there's always something else that pops up. So that's where we have to be more proactive. And like you said, be an investigator and make sure it doesn't happen. Brilliant. And of course, this whole idea of the fact that we're perhaps moving towards a populist world and where third-party data is no longer as accessible and this conversation to run first-party data and it relies on that. How does all of that fit into what we've been talking about? Yeah, so the deprecation of the third-party cookie is a big deal. Meta is especially impacted by this through some of the iOS privacy settings. But I think as an advertiser, you are now just, we've been able to be lazy because the engines have gotten so much data about people that they've been able to give to us. And yeah, why would I have built my first party data if it was so easy to target all sorts of behaviors and all sorts of personal data? But now we have to think about that. We have to mm -hmm. say, maybe I should transmit my customer list into the Google ad system and it's still in a privacy safe manner. But now because it lives in the Google ad system, I can use that as a targeting factor or as a bidding factor. And so, yeah, think more about who are your audiences? What is your first party user data and how can you deploy that to be, to, to bear on your campaigns? There's some really cool examples that we've seen in case studies where I've been judging like some PPC awards, but basically a furniture company says, we're going to build audiences based around the, the style of furniture that someone likes. Do they like the Scandinavian very minimal or do they like very ornate Renaissance furniture or are they more into the country house style? There's all these, and I don't even know what types of furniture are out there, but you have a hundred ways to classify it. If somebody goes and looks for a kitchen table, wouldn't you rather be able to use your first party day and say, hey, listen, this is a returning customer who's shown a propensity towards this kind of furniture. So when they look for something generic, we immediately show them the type of thing that they're actually like, as opposed to some random table from our whole assortment. And that's a power, right? So think about what that can do to your business and how that can put you on a, a higher echelon than your competitors. Brilliant. We covered a fair bit of ground, I think, Fred, but is there perhaps a couple of aspects to this whole idea of BC? marketing and strategy that you find it doesn't get much airtime or it doesn't get talked about very much? If so, what would they be? I think we've covered quite a lot here, Vinay, and automation layering, I think is the key thing, right? I think the fundamental concept that people have to remember is Google uses very sophisticated, very expensive to create artificial intelligence to make advertising easier 
and more accessible to the masses. So you no longer have to be a marketing expert to get decent results from Google ads. But what a lot of people then miss is there still is a place for you as a human to layer your own automations on top of that. And those automations don't have to be sophisticated. You don't have to spend a lot of money on that. This can be simple rule-based stuff that looks at your business criteria or that just pulls in some of your business levers. Like what is your margin for different product categories? That enables you to do not bidding to a return on ad spend, but it's like bid to profit, right? Oh, by the way, like return on ad spend, does anyone care about that? Sure we do because Google makes us, but at the end of the day, I care about profit in the business. That's the thing that I think is sometimes missed a little bit. And as we get so ingrained in this world that Google has painted of, this is how ads work. Like we got to step back. We got to equate that back to business drivers. And, and that's when people do it. That's when they see the most success. And uh, to wrap things up, if you were listening to this episode, what would you say would be your top takeaway? I would love people to start watching the, the show that we do, which is PPC Town Hall. Okay. So if you liked what we went into a lot of detail and what we do is we bring in experts and we talk very tactically about like, well, how do you deal with performance max campaigns? How do you bring GPT into your PPC management? What do you do when Google makes keywords less exact? So I think there's, it's hard to have one takeaway other than this is a fast moving space. So listen to your podcast, keep listening to your podcast, but seek out other experts, read search engine land, talk to other experts and see what they're worried about. Just like we said, listen, you got, you always got to talk to your customers because that tells you what you need to build. But likewise, talk to your peers in the industry. Like what issues are they facing? How are they solving it? It just makes business so much easier if you don't have to figure out everything by yourself. And if listeners are curious and want to find out more or connect with you, where would you recommend they head to? Yeah, find me on LinkedIn. And then obviously go to optimizer.com. Check that out. You can subscribe to our PPC Town Hall podcast. You can sign up for a two-week free trial, see what the software can do. We manage billions upon billions of dollars of ad spend. So it's good software. A lot of people really like it and find a lot of value in it. So we'd love for you to check it out as well. LinkedIn will include links to that in the show notes. Fred, this has been terrific. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having me, Vinay. Thanks everyone for listening. Mm.